Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for this uh, new session of Elderflow webinar. So uh, this uh, first session will be co-hosted uh, with Bronkhorst, our partner for about five years now, and will be represented by uh, Gerhard Bowis, uh, who is also online and that you also might see on the webcam. So uh, this uh, webinar will be composed of uh, two parts. The first part uh, will be a uh, presentation uh, about uh, for, from me and from Gerard uh, that will last about 20 to 25 minutes, followed by a Q&A session so, uh, of 15 minutes. So uh, to begin with, a quick introduction about both our companies for the one who don't know us. So uh, LV Flow has been founded in 2011 in Paris, France, and we are now the world leader in microfluidic instrumentation and more generally low flow instrumentation. So our goal is really to help uh, boost scientific discoveries uh, in, the, in these fields and allows researchers and engineers uh, to have the best possible equipment to, to work in those fields. Uh, hello uh, to all of you. I, I'm Gerard Bauhuis. I'm uh, an industry specialist or uh, uh, application developer in Broncast, and my specialty is on batch dosing and dosing applications. Um, Together with the, with the customer, I try to find the best solution for their uh, batch dosing or dosing applications um, so, so that they can do the best job they want. Um, for Broncos, Broncos is a specialist in measurement and control of low flow fluidics. And we have more than 40 years experience in developing, manufacturing, high quality mass flow meters and controllers. Um, Broncos organization is represented worldwide and we have an extensive network of subsidiaries, distributors, and service station. And the headquarters is in Riolo, the Netherlands. Right, thanks, Gerard. Um, so a quick, uh, intro, a quick overview of uh, the content of this webinar. So we'll first uh, start with uh, an introduction about, our, the, about what we mean by universal flow control. Then uh, we'll go a little bit more details into the different flow control solutions that are possible and we'll uh, emphasize uh, what a pressure-driven flow control is. Uh, then Gerhardt is going to give uh, more details about the Coriolis flow sensor that Broncourse is providing and overall uh, the overall uh, product range of Broncourse. And then we'll uh, give you a quick insight to a couple of applications that combines both our equipment uh, and, uh, and we'll come up with a couple of conclusions. So to start with, uh, what did we mean by uh, universal flow control? So basically we meant by that the control and measurement of fluid flow at milli, micro and sub micro scale. So why did we use the word universal? Because we, uh, we work, we can work with our equipment using any fluid, meaning either gas, liquid, or even fluid mixtures such as emulsions or foams. Uh, basically, who are the main users of this equipment? I guess you all, uh, but uh, overall, it's any researcher or industrials, uh, people that are working at low flow rate, so, but, uh, so below around 50 ml per minute, so basically under a laminar condition. And how do we achieve the best in this field? Basically, by combining high accuracy flow control systems, so basically the pump that Elderflow provides, together with a high accuracy flow measurement instruments, the, the sensor which Broncors provide. Thus, the reason of this webinar today. Um, to begin with, so a quick introduction, a quick overview of the three main uh, flow control methods currently used in uh, microfluidics and low flow. So uh, two you might be familiar with, so syringe pump and peristaltic pump and pressure driven flow control, which is uh, what we use here at LV Flow. So um, as a reminder, so uh, in the syringe pump, uh, the liquid is pushed thanks to the mechanical movement of a plunger into a, a syringe. And so these methods are the advantage of having good volumetric control, but due to the non-linearity of, of the mechanical movement of the plunger in the syringe, this leads to first a quite pulsatile flow. And I guess you guys who've already been using syringe pump can testify, and also to quite long response time. In the, in the several second range. On the other hand, a uh, peristaltic pump uh, uses the mechanical action of a rotary element on the flexible tubing to push the liquid from the inlet to the outlet. But uh, the main hassle with this technique is that it leads to an even more positive flow than syringe. This is why we came up with this method of pressure-driven flow control. So uh, to give you an insight on how it's working. 
It's quite simple. You basically need uh, two pieces of equipment, a pressure controller and a reservoir. So you need to hook up your pressure controller to a high pressure supply and or or any that can be any gas supply in, in a gas line in the lab or anything or a compressor. And then our pressure controller will regulate down these very precise and um, stable and uh, this, uh, this, this pressure down to a very precise and stable output that can be controlled. We'll then use this controlled gas pressure to pressurize the sealed reservoir where your liquid is stored and the pressure will basically push on the liquid to make it flow through the fluidic system as depicted on the picture on the right here. Um, so there you go. You can also use vacuum. So our controllers also have the ability of handling vacuum. Uh, they actually can handle both pressure and vacuum at the same time. Uh, and to, in order to suck liquid and to pull liquid instead of not only pushing it. Um, to go into more detail, now how do you relate pressure to flow rate? Uh, the, the relationship between the two is what we call the microfluidic resistance and it's basically dependent on the dimensions of the circuit. To give you a quick image of that, basically uh, it's going to be easier to push liquid through a large pipe rather than through a very, very tiny one. Uh, we also, so all our equipment is, is uh, provided and is controlled through our software interface, which allows for the communications of any of our equipment, so our pressure controller, but also, for instance, the flow sensor that Broncos provide. How do you actually carry out some accurate flow control using our system? This is pretty straightforward. You need to combine our pressure control system together with a a flow sensor such as the one provided by Broncos. When doing so, you get you have then, then two possibilities to work with the system. The first one is to set a pressure at the inlet of your system and um, use the flow sensor simply as a monitoring element so as to sort of sense the liquid flow in your setup. The other option is to change and to set up a feedback loop between the two elements so as to be in flow rate control mode. In that mode, the, the, you will set a target pressure, a target flow rate for your system and the inlet pressure will automatically adapt so as to reach the target flow rate. All right, these can all be done thanks to our software environment, which allows the full automation of this process. Um, so now that I've explained to you the, the working principle of pressure-driven flow control, let me uh, give you like the main advantages these methods have compared to all the peristaltic pump and syringe pump system, for instance, you can, you can have. Uh, they have a very, very fast response time. So you can, we can go down to 40 milliseconds. Uh, it has an extremely high stability. So down to 0.006% of, of, of your flow rate, which is unmatched uh, uh, to the best of my knowledge. We also have the possibility of working with very small and very large volumes, up to liters, for instance. You can, you also have the ability to access both flow rate and pressure at the same time. So that can allow you to have a more versatile control over your system parameters. You can work with any liquid, so a wide versatility. Uh, you also can access many different types of flow rate range. And it also has the advantage of opening up new fluidic system designs. And I will introduce this uh, in later in this uh, presentation. Uh, here is a quick overview of uh, the, per the specifications of our system. We offer five different uh, pressure ranges uh, that covers both either positive or positive and negative pressure. And as you can see here, the accuracy can go, the stability of the system can do go down to 0.005% of the flow rate and also the, the, the response time of the system down to 35 milliseconds. Now, Gerard, the floor is yours. Um, OK, first of all, I would like to give you some background on the Coriolis force, which we are using in our instruments to measure flow, uh, mass flow, to be, to be right. Um, an example in real life would be the water in your sink um, at home. It is turning clockwise when it goes down to the drain. And it's turning clockwise. It is caused by Coriolis force walking on, working on the water. Of course, on the southern hemisphere, this is different. Um, how, how do we? How can we measure the practical implementation of the Coriolis force in our in our instruments? Uh, assume you have a, 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 a sensor tube, like shown in picture one, 
Then uh, the first requirement we need to fulfill is that it needs to be a rotating system. And we simulate this by making a vibration in the tube. So the tube goes up and down. The second requirement is that there needs to be a, a kind of speed difference to, to make a force working on the mass flowing through it. And that you can see in picture two, if you look at the flow coming in at this point, this is, this is fixed, so there's no speed and the flow goes through the tube and at the point where the vibration is maximum, the speed will be maximum. And when it goes further to the outlet, there the speed is zero again. So you have two speed differences working on it. And according to the first law of Newton, uh, force is mass times acceleration. There will be two forces working on this on this on this sensor tube. And the more mass is running, the more the larger the force will be. Um, so what what will this force do? This force will cause the, the, the tube to bend. And this bending is something we can measure and and calculate back into uh, mass flow. So the um, it, is, it has a direct relation between the bending first the, 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 uh, the force and then to the mass. So more force means more for uh, more uh, bending and more mass flow. Uh, in Bronkhorst, we use a special uh, shape, so the, uh, the, the square shape for the sensor tube. And how it works is in the twist mode. That is something that we do in our, in our instrument. And the Coriolis force working on it will try to make this swing mode. And in the result that you can see, that is making a, a, some kind of twisting, bending the movement. That's something we measure, and based on that, we calculate the mass flow running through it. So, what are the what are the advantages for using a Coriolis instrument? Um, it is direct mass flow measurement, so it will be independent of fluid properties. Um, it can measure both liquids and gases with the same sensor. The meter is metal sealed. Um, it's very accurate and very excellent repeatability. Um, the repeatability is very, very, very good. Um, there's a PID controller on board if you want to control a pump or a valve or something else. Um, like in, in the L-flow set, the, uh, there are sometimes you can, you can um, control the, the pressure that is making the flow. Um, Bidirection measurement is possible. We have optimal, uh, optional fuel bus communications available. Uh, there's always Corifil technology inside, so that means that you can make a kind of batch dosing, for example, 10 grams in, one, in, in two seconds. That would be possible. Um, additional density and temperature outputs are available. Mm, yeah. Then for the microfluidics products that we have, um, we come back to the uh, ML120 and M12 that are Coriolis instruments, meters or controllers. And uh, for example, the ML120, um, it's going down to uh, 0.0017 to 3.3 milliliters per minute H2O. Um, larger uh, instruments that we have in the same range are M13 and M14, but I, I will show that on the next slide. Um, other, other ones we have is the, the LO1s. These are uh, using the thermal uh, measurement uh, principle, and this, these can go even lower in, in flow like, um, for example, 0.017 to 5 microliters a minute. Um, there are also OEM uh, uh, versions available from this instrument. Uh, so the range is overview. Um, yeah, this is the whole range we have in Coriolis. And there's one also extra, that's the S-Flow, um, that is using ultrasonic technology. Um, for this for this low flow mic microfluidics, um, the ML120 and M12 are the in most interesting ones. Um, the ML120 can go down to a minimum flow of 50 milligrams an hour. That means two droplets of water in one hour. Next page. Yeah. So um, the total Broncos portfolio, how does it look like? Um, we have gas uh, flow meters and controllers. We have fluid flow meters and controllers. We have pressure meters and controllers. And combining this, we can also do vapor control, um, especially we have, we have also all the co other combinations available, like a pump and a Coriolis or a pump and an S flow for uh, making dosages. Uh, we can also deliver skits and also manifolds that combining a lot of these instruments together to make a certain application. And we also have a, a standalone unit that is a liquid dosing module and it can operate standalone next to a machine and do its job. Thank you very right. much. Thanks, Gerhard. Thanks for, for this introduction to 
uh, Bronkhorst um, Instruments Ranch. So um, as I said at the beginning, I'm now, um, I am now going to give you a quick introduction to a couple of applications where um, both uh, the heavy flow, high accuracy flow control system and the Bronkhorst high accuracy sensing system are combined together. Uh, so um, uh, we, in this presentation, in this part of the presentation, we are gonna highlight, uh, first of all, the advantage of having an all-in-one uh, flow control platform, which actually allows for full system automation through a couple of biology examples. Also, we're gonna, uh, in, we're gonna give you an example of how, what kind of level of accuracy can you achieve with this kind of system? And also one of the uh, unique capabilities that uh, is allowed by pressure driven flow control. So uh, to begin with, uh, here is an example in biology of the use of the Bronkhorst flow sensor together with the OB1 pressure controller uh, for the study of C. elegans uh, in the lab of Sean Lockery. So you might uh, know this, uh, him because he's already the founder of NEMA Metrics, uh, who is uh, now in vivo biosystems uh, and is also working at the Institute, uh, Institute of Neuroscience in the Oregon University. Uh, so they, uh, here they basically use the nematode worm C. elegans as a genetic model for drug testing or uh, for behavioral experiments. In this uh, specific case, they, they studied the, uh, the, val the value-based decision. So uh, to do so, they developed a microfluidic chip that is depicted on the bottom left of your screen uh, in which worm can crawl. Then they perfuse the, the chip with two streams of uh, liquid containing, containing two different types of bat bacteria, so, which is a source of food for C. elegans. And uh, they basically made vary the, the concentration and the quality of bacteria in their system. Then uh, they studied the behavior of the, uh, the worm and, and so how they were, uh, which kind of food they were choosing. choosing. Uh, doing so, they were able to show that C. elegans makes rational economic decisions. The worm are actually guided by both the quality and the quantity of food. Uh, and so they used that to test the mutants and uh, the effect uh, of uh, different drugs, for example. Uh, for example. Um, so why have they chosen these solutions for this specific uh, system? First of all, uh, there is a major challenge here, which is to manage to keep the uh, stable boundary between the two flows uh, due to the bacterial slurries and the two different viscosities of the liquid. Using the Bronkors, the high accuracy Bronkor sensor, together with the OB1, allowed to maintain a very, very stable flow rate in both systems and to maintain the, uh, the interface very constant. At the same time, uh, using both systems also allow to try many different types of uh, of, uh, of uh, bacterial um, uh, uh, liquid with bacteria because the viscosity varies a lot between uh, from experiment to experiment, which then allows for a very high reproducibility. Finally, uh, the combination of both systems has a major advantage is that it has a great material compatibility, uh, meaning that uh, because the Bronkhorst uh, sensor are using stainless steel, we're uh, all the only um, uh, element that is in contact with the fluid on our side is uh, the PTFE. So uh, this makes it very, very um, um, biological friendly. So here a couple more examples of uh, biology applications we work a lot on and uh, where the system can have a huge benefit. So for instance, on the left organ and chip applications. So this is a very uh, popular topic uh, in biology right now. And uh, we actually offer a very versatile uh, tool set for uh, for biologists working on organ and a chip. And we even offer a full application, a very versatile application pack for this system, for instance, to make your own lung on a chip and so on. Uh, more generally, we also work a lot on dynamic cell culture application. And, uh, and also we have uh, the ability to work, uh, to work between biology and uh, uh, microfluidics. For instance, in biophysics applications or for applications such as uh, cell encapsulation, which actually leads me to my next topic, which is uh, droplet generation. So this application instead is one of the most studied topic in microfluidic itself. So uh, to, to, to generate drop, just for the people that are not in the field exactly, so to generate droplets in microfluidics, uh, you basically need to use two immiscible phase, most often oil and water, and you make the meat 
at an extension as uh, shown in the picture in the middle of, of your of the slide. Um, here, the dispersed and uh, the the dispersed and the continuous phase are going to meet, and the the dispersed phase is going to get squeezed between the continuous uh, between the continuous phase, which leads to the generation of droplets. The main advantage of using microfluidics for this method is that it has you can generate droplets with very, very low diameter. And also you have a very high homogeneity in your droplet. So very good control of your, sorry, control of your payload. The applications are quite wide. So uh, you have a uh, droplet generation, uh, which is a field on its own, but you can also do some cell encapsulation, some uh, what we call drop sex, so sequencing inside the cell. You can also generate hydrogel beads uh, using it. Uh, and basically that's, that's uh, or you can also do some PCR with it. Um, the, um, so why using uh, the combination of both uh, systems here? It's pretty simple is that, as I said, one of the main advantage of this, of, of uh, generating droplets with microfluidics is, um, is very high homogeneity. And so to achieve it, you need to maintain a very, very stable flow rate in your system. And therefore combining the uh, LV flow system together with Broncor system allows you to achieve the highest level of accuracy and thus the highest homogeneity. Um, lastly, so a quick introduction to one of the possibilities that is offered by pressure-driven control compared to other flow control methods. Um, so uh, this is our sequential, uh, li sequential liquid injection system. So uh, to make it simple, uh, as depicted on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, how this works. So we would use the same pressure control system as before, but instead of pressurizing only one reservoir, so we would simply split the uh, pressure to pressurize multiple reservoirs. Uh, this multiple reservoir being all pressurized, all the liquids are going to be pushed out of the reservoir all the way to distribution valve, which basically acts as a selector. And then you will, by moving the distribution valve, you will, you will uh, decide which of the liquid goes through your fluidic system. Uh, this is actually widely used for both research and uh, industrial applications. Uh, for instance, if you take a very simple example, uh, you have all the fish-related applications of fluorescence in situ hybridization, which uh, requires the injection of sometimes up to 30 samples inside the chip. Uh, you also have many applications in flow chemistry, drug screening, uh, cell culture can also benefit a lot from, uh, from this kind of system, and also anything that relates to uh, sensor calibration, but to make it uh, essentially uh, in more generally uh, or any application that requires the successive injections of two or more liquids. The main advantage of this system, again, combined with the Broncor's flow sensor, uh, it's pretty straightforward and I already said it a lot. So you have full system automation, a broad range of flow rate accessible thanks to the, the dynamic range of the Broncor's flow sensor, great material compatibility as this discussed before. Uh, but in the possibility of working with different types of liquids with the same sensor, which is not the case, for instance, with standard uh, thermal-based uh, sensors. Also, again, high stability and an easy integration to your system. So to conclude all this, uh, all this uh, presentation, uh, here are the things uh, you need, uh, you know, in a, in a, in a standard um, experiment, what, what is important is to be able to I currently control the measurement of the flow rate and the pressure, so have to have a full control over the experimental parameters of your system. Uh, have you also have the ability with this system to have a, a versatile setup, so have a broad liquid and gas compatibility, and this is also this also has the advantage of being an all-in-one pl platform. So if you have to take something out using this system, you have the ability of having. Highly reproducible results, a very versatile setup, and being able to fully automatize the system. So, uh, if you want to learn more, I uh, highly uh, suggest you to have a look at our website, uh, both Elevator and Broncors. There is a lot of content available there, and you can also feel free to reach out to us uh, at Elevator and Broncors, and we'll be more than happy to help. Um, so, now uh, is the QA session. So, as I said at the beginning, uh, we'll take the question one by one from the first to the last. Uh, feel free to ask any questions you may have, and uh, Gerhard and I will do our best to answer them. Uh, anyhow, if you miss uh, if you miss the Q and A session live, you can still shoot us an email, and we'll be happy to help with that. All right, thank you all again. To begin with, a question from 
from David. So could you use the ES flow instead of the Cori lower delta P? So I'm not sure what the ES flow is. I guess that's a, an instrument from your range, Garrett. Yeah, that's our ultrasonic instrument. But uh, David already, I, I know him. He uh, he never said uh, give an answer. Never mind the question was addressed in the presentation. So question, <laughs> answer. Already. All right, good, got it. <laughs> of course, of course, you can you can use an S flow, but um, that 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 needs to be implemented then in the uh, in the Elva flow system. Yeah, and I believe uh, if I if I'm correct and tell me if I'm wrong, uh, this sensor don't address the microliter uh, flow rate range. If I'm correct. Yeah, it's, it's going down to four milliliters per minute. Uh, yeah, that's it. And whereas most of our application in microfluidics actually uh, relates to sub ml uh, range, so yeah, that wouldn't be the best fit. Though it's actually a good idea because having a non-contact sensor would be extremely handy. Yeah, uh, yeah. at this flow rate. A whole large is a measurement error of the ml twenty having a flow of two to four microliter. Yeah, that means. Uh, what do you mean with two to four milliliter? Uh, microliter per minute or per, per hour or whatever. Okay, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll let uh, Michael uh, detail this question a bit more. So, okay, got the question, uh, the answer from David, so all good. Uh, so, Ant Antonios, uh, can we use Broncor's liquid flow meter for biological fluid like blood? Uh, yeah, it, it, uh, the meter is all um, metal, metal sealed, so it's all, only metal. And we have, uh, in this case, we have uh, stainless steel and we have Hesseloy. So I think it will be uh, possible to use it with blood. I think there are even applications uh, using it together yeah. with the pump. We actually, uh, we work with a couple of institutes here in France are you using actually both equipment uh, for blood applications. So I'm more than happy to share the reference if needed. Yep. Uh, one question from Daya Kumar. Can we have some OEM device from Elveflow? If so, what is the M? OQ. So we indeed provide um, we indeed provide um, OEM version of our equipment. I highly suggest you to shoot me an email if you have any more questions about it, and we can uh, definitely answer these questions later. Uh, so one question from Ricardo. Uh, so what are the wetted materials in the Broncos liquid flow meters, and what is the fluid compatibility? So I guess Gerard, you just answered that questions. Yes, I think so. Stainless steel and uh, SLOI. Yes. Very good liquid compatibility overall. Yes. Uh, wh what is the dead volume of the distribution vi uh, valve device alone? So I'm going to be fully honest. Uh, we just recently uh, introduced a new valve to our range, so I don't have uh, the value in mind right now. I know it's a few microliters, but I don't want to say anything wrong to you. So I suggest you go on our website. You can download our catalog uh, easily, and uh, the answer is is there if you if you want to know. Uh, how the uh, one question from uh, Cortez: uh, How the flow sensor is cleaned? Does it need to be flushed out each time? Is it used to avoid cross contamination? Yeah, of course. If if, you, if there's something inside the tubes, you need to flush it to get yep. uh, to get it out. We usually, uh, when you're working with biological material, we highly suggest people to use, for instance, ethanol or stuff like, or liquids like this to basically purge the system, and then you blow it with air, and then you can inject any other liquid if you want to be hundred percent sure that uh, you, there is no cross contamination between the between the samples. Um, so one question from my Andy, how is this all sterility is maintained during the course of experiments? So the advantage of this kind of system is that it's sort of like sealed because you control it with pressure. And so there shouldn't be any particles that gets in. Also, the only element that can come inside your system is actually uh, can would be would come from the pressure or for the high pressure supply that comes in. And we provide a set of filters that allows you to filter out any any particles or anything like this uh, to uh, in order to, uh, to to have the, um, yeah, to keep the serenity in your system. So Daya Kumar, thanks for the, for the, the nice comment. Uh, how to avoid contamination during the whole operation? I mean, when you work alone, no assistant. Well, that's basically what we've been mentioning before. So once the system is uh, set up, it's sealed. So there shouldn't be any, any con contamination happening. Uh, one question from Pierre. Uh, what is the range of viscosity that can be used for both equipments? Um, so Gerard, uh, maybe you have an answer on your side. I'll let you get started. Um, yeah, what we normally say for our uh, meters um, and controllers, 
um, it depends on how much pressure you have available. Um, if you have, because there's a pressure drop over the meter itself, uh, you will need some pressure to get uh, to get the liquid through. And the more viscose it, it is, the more pressure you will need. That's exactly the same answer I would I would come up with. So our systems uh, here tell the food we have the ability to control pressure up to eight bar. So uh, when you uh, so basically the range of viscosity you can access will mostly depends on the flow rate you want to achieve and and the pressure you have available in your system and also the typical dimension of your setup. You the the viscosity is usually taken into account um, into the microfluidic resistance, which I briefly talked about in the presentation. Uh, if you want to know more about this, I highly suggest you. So on our website, we now have a calculator that allows you to very easily compute like the flow rate that can be achieved for any different types of liquids uh, using pressure-driven flow control. So go, go on there and uh, and uh, and enter all your system parameters and you will be able to, to sort of like get a sense of what's achievable. So one question from Mayandi. So do you also sell microfluidic device in addition to controllers, or will this work with third-party devices? <clears throat> so very good question from Mayandi. Uh, thank you very much for that. So making it simple, uh, Elderflow core competency is in a fluidic flow control, all right? However, we know that the fluidic system is composed of this flow control part, but also uh, of the chip part, all right? Um, so we actually provide some chip, but we are not chip, uh, chip founders. We have partners for this. So either we can put you in contact with this partner, or we we can sometimes, or we have it available in our in our standard catalog, but which is a bit limited. Uh, in addition to this, um, so to answer your second question, uh, our flow control system, the outlet of our flow control system is actually a very standard one sixteenth OD PTFE tubing, which is the tubing everybody's using in microfluidics. And so using this, you can basically, can basically connect to any chip you can find on the market uh, very, very easily, as long as you have the proper connector for it. Okay, all right. So Michael uh, said, uh, so coming back to the question of Michael, which was what is the accuracy you can achieve down to two to four uh, microliter per, he meant per minute for the okay. ML120. Yes, the, uh, the accuracy will be open 2% and there will be some influence of the zero stability. And uh, this, this depends on how good, your, um, uh, how good you can uh, control your environment, um, but there will be some, some influence of it. But basically, uh, the, the accuracy is open 2%. All right, good. Thanks, Thanks for the answer. Uh, so one question from Ricardo. So in cell culture application, how do you maintain sterility or avoid cross-contamination if using an incubator and the other flow system? So uh, to begin with, uh, so um, here, this is a very uh, long discussion we can have about incubators and, and microfluidics. Uh, so there are a couple of elements to take into account here. So first of all, don't forget that our system is sort of sealed. It shouldn't uh, interact much with the environment. So working in a humid incubator doesn't really make sense because there wouldn't be any uh, water exchange with the re rest of the system. In addition to this, now if you work in a, in a dry incubator, which uh, actually exists, uh, you could definitely use our system in there without any problem. Maintaining stability is, uh, you know, the, the advantage of our system is that the reservoir, so where the liquid is, is actually deported away from the, where the controller is. So you could potentially put the reservoirs inside your uh, incubator and keep the controller outside of it. And now if you maintain stability in, in the reservoirs, which are for you to know the reservoir you're using are standard Eppendorf or Falcon reservoirs, you could, or even larger bottles like, than this, uh, you could simply sterilize them using a sort of any autoclavable system and uh, work as usual with your biological sample. Um, so one question from Cortes, any possibility to work with non-Newtonian fluids, such as blood for the Coriolis flow sensor, but what might change, what might be the cleaning rinsing, rinsing requirements? Okay, for non-Newtonian fluids, I've done some testing in the past and it, we, we, can, uh, we can work with it, it's no problem. The only thing that you need to uh, have in mind is that um, with the different speeds of the uh, the flow, this uh, the viscosity will change. So um, 
might be that you need to uh, um, uh, to mix it first to make it um, running a little. Then it is easier to uh, to control, and then you do not need that much pressure on it. Um, for the cleaning and the rinsing requirement, um, yeah, like like said before, you need to flush the instrument and then dry it. Um, depends on what you think is a good fluid for cleaning with uh, the blood. Yeah, I think that's actually the best uh, the best conclusion for whatever relates to cleaning. Just use the best liquid to clean your sample and flush it to yeah. your system. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one question from Abbas: Do we need to calibrate the curry when using blood? No, calibration is normally not needed because it's fluid independent. And um, so if you want to use water or you use blood or you use uh, uh, ethanol, doesn't matter, it will measure it. Uh, what will be good is to, uh, before you start, uh, after building up your, uh, your system, your setup, then to make an auto zero. And um, you can, all, if, as long as the um, setup stays the same, you don't need to uh, auto zero it again, but it's always good before you start at a new day to, to, to zero again. It's a very simple procedure. It takes you uh, 45 seconds, and then the instrument is uh, ready to go again. Perfect. Thanks for the answer and the clarification, Kerry. Uh, so one question from an uh, unknown user. Is it easy to clean up if the flow meter is clogging? So, um, Bronkhorst, may, um, sorry, Garrett, maybe you have an answer. Uh, I know we give a couple of advice on to our users, but uh, maybe you have a more precise answer for that. Um, yeah, best is to not to clog it, but, <laughs> <laughs> no, but if, if it is clogged, you can always try it with a solvent to, to, uh, to clean it. Um, yeah, it depends I, on, on the clogging it is. If, if you have crystals and it is fully crystallized and closed, then you will not be able to, to open it again. Then you need to, uh, to send it for service and maybe we can, we can do it. But um, normally, if you have a solvent, yeah, you, can, you can solve the clogging. Yeah, that's yeah, that's actually the answer I would give as well. Oh, just, so for you to know, and for the people that are already using our equipment, so if you go on our website, we have a support section, uh, which I highly advise you to have a look at. And in this support section, uh, we actually have a couple of uh, guides on how to clean best the sensor and what kind of solvent to use with what kind of liquid. Uh, feel free to refer to that if you have any questions. I know from experience that the strongest we use is this Helmanex solvent. Uh, which basically is able to clean most of the of the things. Yep. Um, another question from Michael: Can you use the Bronchor flow sensor to measure the flow of a peristaltic pump if the pulsation about twenty hertz is a problem? No, you, you can use it, um, but it will show it. It will show the pulsation if you use it as a meter. It will show the, simply the pulsation of twenty hertz. Yep. Then it, will, it it can it cannot um, change the flow it is seeing. So it will see everything. So it will also see the uh, pulsation. Yep, and I, I would also mention that to me, it's kind of, uh, it, it would be a bit weird to use a peristaltic pump, which is a low stability equipment combined together with such a high accuracy flow sensor from Bronkhorst. Uh, this is actually why we came up into the into working with Bronkhorst, is to have the flow control system performances that actually match the, the sensing performances as well. Yeah, and then... Another one thing would be um, also the we have also controllers that control these kind of pumps, and then it will it will um, regulate a little this this pulsation, but the pulsation cannot be fully uh, away. There will be some something left. Yep. What is the approximately pressure rating of the Coriolis flow uh, flow sensor? The Coriolis sensors they are always uh, the meters are two hundred bar. So yeah, you can definitely use them with our equipment uh, with ease as we go up to 10 bars. All right, so another question. Um, another question from my ND. Uh, if there is a clog, will it shut down automatically instead of blowing the device? So uh, thanks for this very interesting question, my ND. So uh, I very much like it because this is exactly where pressure-driven control comes up uh, being extremely useful compared to syringe pump. So, uh, for instance, because uh, I guess this is what you have experience on, for, given your question. So, when you work with a syringe pump, what is going to happen is that if there is a clog in your circuit, the syringe will keep on pushing up until the point where some part of your circuit will blow up because of the pressure buildup. All right? When you work with pressure control, the advantage is that you actually regulate the system in pressure. So, if, instead of having the, uh, so, you know, the pressure will remain constant in your system. You're just going to see the the flow rate actually going down back to zero, but you have literally no risk of having a pressure buildup happening because you, you control the pressure in your system. 
Does it? I hope it makes sense. One other question from Cortez. Uh, can components shown in the example of your applications uh, be supplied as a standalone component or and as a standalone component integrated for experimental systems? So I don't, I'm not sure I understand your question, but uh, if I can ans uh, answer the two aspects. So first one, uh, Yes, we provide we provide our component as a standalone that can potentially be integrated into uh into in you can also integrate this equipment to, to your experimental system with ease. Um, so a question from Maxim: uh, Can we use your system for larger scale? Like, what if we want to use a scale up in a chemical reaction using a quarter or or an one eighth of an inch outer outer diameter tubing? So um. So I guess for what relates to overflow side, there is definitely no problem uh, for using one eighth tubing. Uh, and a quarter tubing can also be doable, but with a bit of a trick, uh, just for you to know. So the outlet of our reservoirs are a quarter 28. So as long as you get a quarter 28 to one uh, eighth of an inch tu uh, tubing connector, uh, you can definitely use it. Uh, to give you a sense of that, um, in, if you well, if you push our system to its boundaries uh, at large scale, uh, we have people working with reservoirs up to 20 liters at several hundreds of ml per minute. All right, they would use rather large tubing for it, and they actually combine it with one of the broncor, uh, with one of the sensor for bron from broncors for that because this is the the sensor we actually provide for this low rate range. But this is definitely something achievable. This has a couple of limitations, but we can definitely discuss them later. Uh, Maxim, if you have any more questions about that, feel free to reach out to, to me at contact.tailtheflow.com and we can discuss it. Uh, what is the maximum and minimum throughput of droplet per second generation of your system? Do you have any sensor for feedback of this response? So uh, a typical droplet generation system will generate droplet between 500 hertz to 10 kilohertz, all right, under normal pressure. Um, then uh, if, you want to, we, if you want to know more about this, I highly suggest you to go on our website and download our uh, uh, droplet generation user guide, which is a user guide we've recently released uh, that details step-by-step -step how to set up your own droplet generation system. And that also gives you all the insights on uh, the results you can achieve, tips and hints on how to set up your own system. And for sure, we can definitely, in this case, provide you with the, the corresponding chip for your setup. Um, so Mayandi uh, was asking uh, if it will work with EBD device or there are in case in 1.17 millimeter thick cover glass and if there is wall thickness restricted, restricting your flow controllers. So no, there should be most of the glass chip specifically can handle pressure up to a few bars without any problem. There is limitation with PDMS where it can, uh, which can only work up to two bar, but this is the case whether whatever system you use, uh, but for glass chip, usually they're a bit more versatile. All right. Uh, uh, do we have a U, so we don't, we actually, uh, so do we have US support? So we actually deal with all our users worldwide from France, but we are used to this. We have more than a thousand systems in the US. So you can definitely reach out to us if you have any questions. So again, uh, don't, so I think this is all for the questions for now. So, uh, so as a reminder, don't miss the replay to do so subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, it's also gonna be available on our website. And uh, again, uh, feel free to come back to us if you have any more questions. Thank you very much all and uh, have a great end of the day for uh, for the one in Europe and the day for uh, Americans. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye-bye.